put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Sin City Move Review. This is a this is put together of by three with three whatever three stories. All of them set in the titular Sin City and with some of the same characters, although they're not presented in chronological order, but if you actually pay attention to small details, you will be able to place them in correct chronological order. Now, the three stories are... You know, the title of the first one escapes me, but anyway, it is... Marv, played by Mickey Rourke, in one of the most perfect roles for him, and it's him at some of his most badass. He sleeps with this young woman who he's just completely, you know, he he met her just that night, and he just, he, he describes her as an angel. She smells the way angels ought to smell. He wakes up the next morning, and she's dead. And as it turns out, he's being framed for her murder. And because of how much he cared about her, how how much he appreciates that she was nice to him, because he's not used to people being nice to him, especially women. He's not the most attractive. So he swears to avenge her, brutally, the way he likes to go about handling things. And, yeah, I think that's about what I should give away for that one. The second one is about Dwight, played excellently by Clive Owen, who's, again, a bit of an anti-hero, but maybe slightly less of, you know, not quite as brutal as Marv, well, not anywhere near as brutal as Marv. He has just met back up with one of his previous girlfriends, or, yeah, he's seeing this girl Shelley, played by Brittany Murphy, rest in peace, who does fantastic. Really alive performance. Yeah, vivid, I guess is the word. And he finds that she has, she's been with this other man, and he's not, it's not that he's jealous, but this other man is quite abusive. Jackie Boy, played by Benicio Del Toro. Fantastic, again. I, I'm gonna have to stop saying that. Okay, for the rest of the video, everyone who acts in this does an excellent job. The one... The one exception being Jessica Alba. But when is Jessica Alba ever good in anything? This is actually one of her less poor performances. Although, anyway, Benicio Del Toro. And he's this really great... Yeah, the, the bad guys in this movie... Yeah, I hate them. You, you... If... if, Like, if they were in front of you, you wouldn't be able to resist punching them. You know? Face or nads, something. Just... Yeah. Just... Yeah, you hate them, and you want to see them pay, you know? So, yeah. He's this... <sighs> delusional, he, he has this thing very early on, he'll like say, you know, I don't know, I don't really want to give anything away, but he'll like say, I never did that, and then he'll go and do it, 
you know, and, and he'll just talk about how he's, he has, he has the, I think it's Chris Brown, he has the Chris Brown thing going on, you know, he, he's talking to Shelley, the Brittany Murphy character, through this, you know, door that's, it's locked with that, you know, keychain kind of thing, and he's like saying, I know, you know, you're, you're busting, you're busting my balls, you're mad at me, and I forgive you for that. Without you even asking me to, you know, he's just, oh man, you want to see this guy just in pain, you know. So anyway, Dwight, <laughs> I don't want to give, give away how, but he manages to chase Jackie Boy out of Shelley's apartment. And he chases him because he knows that Jackie Boy's up to no good. And he's got four friends with him, all of them are drunk and up to no good. And he wants to make sure that, you know, no one gets hurt by them. And he chases Jackie Boy all the way into, or, you know, follows him all the way into Old Town, which is where the sex workers reside and rule. Cops don't go into Old Town. They know that the girls take care of the law there. So it would seem that things are under control, but... Dwight doesn't know quite just how bad things can get. And finally, we have... Oh, by the way, that story was the the big fat kill. The first one was the hard goodbye, now I remembered. And finally, we have that, the, that yellow bastard. Yellow bastard, maybe it's just yellow bastard. Anyway, Bruce Willis. Also at some of his most badass, and, and I just let that sink in. Okay, just this is this is the guy from Die Hard, you know. This is, yeah, Bruce Willis at his most badass. Just think about that for a second. And it's also just like you know one of his best roles in like I don't know, ten, fifty years. So yeah, at least ten years. So yeah, he is this cop, you know, and. <laughs> I don't know, I guess he's, he's the closest thing we get to getting away from the anti-hero as the lead, as the protagonist, anyway. He is desperate to keep this girl, this 11-year-old girl, Nancy Callahan, safe from this rapist bastard, Rourke Jr., Nick Stahl, I, I didn't know he could act. Maybe maybe I need to see him in more than this and Terminator 3, but Terminator 3, I didn't really get the impression that he could act. In this, yeah, I, I need to stop talking about how well people act in this, but he is just despicable. He is this utter spoiled brat. Just complete psychopath, you know. And, yeah, Hardigan is willing to go to great lengths to protect her. And I suppose that's more or less what I should say for that. I, I will say that that contains a villain, you know, the yellow bastard, who I understand that he was supposed to be like a, you know, I don't know, a parody sort of of villains like the Joker, you know, where it's this grotesque appearance. So, yeah. And. Excuse me, Yellow Bastard is literally yellow, you know, and that actually, you know, now that the plot's out of the way, this film is almost entirely in black and white. You know, you have pretty much that nice, strong, stark black and white, but there are some things that are, you know, they're, they're drawn forth with, with color, with strong color. Yellow Bastard is one of them. He is literally completely yellow, and it's this strong kind of yellow. I don't know, I'm, I'm not a color person, but yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, it just, it really comes out at you, you know, and you, you have other things. There's, you know, one, one woman is in this really strongly red dress, you know, and you just really hope that that's not the one from Schindler's List. Anyway, 
you know, and you, there, there are some, a few characters who, like, maybe their eyes get, you know, even, even the blood actually tends to be white. This is, you know, for those of you who have never read Sin City and have watched this film, it's like noir with a nice, solid shot of adrenaline, you know, it, you basically have the kind of noir feel to it and that very dark, bleak kind of story, setting, and, you know, characters. And then there is this, you know, it's, yeah, it's got a bit of a kick to it, you know, there, and as such, it, I'm not sure you could completely call it an action film, I'd maybe mainly label it a thriller with some action scenes, you know, but it's not, you know, coming from Rodriguez, you maybe expect an action film, and it's not quite as much of an action film as several other things he's done. However, and I want to make this absolutely clear, at least to me, this is by far his best film. And a big reason for that, pretty much the entire reason, is that he did not write the script. Because the man cannot write. At all. Okay, it's just, he is great at visualizing and putting things up there on the screen. And some of his concepts are good, but scripts as, as a whole, story structure, characters, no, just keep them away from that. And that's what they did here. The script and the, you know, the entire look, the characters, the dialogue, all of it is straight from Frank Miller. This is how you adapt a comic book. They literally took the pages and put it up on the screen. You know, they... They cast the roles, they filmed the frames. I mean, the framing is pretty much without exception as it is in the comic book. And actually, one might think that that means it's kind of, you know, that it lacks sort of the dynamic feel. You can somewhat tell that they used a comic book for a blueprint. There are some shots that feel a little static, but the camera is nice and loose in a lot of this, and there are some nice broad sweeping shots. It's actually one of the best, one of the, yeah, best filmed movies by Rodriguez. And the dialogue, you know, I mean, there are different opinions on Frank Miller's writing. I haven't read everything by him, but I'm, quite a bit of what I've read, I love. You know, he just has this real knack for noir. And just the, the dialogue, you have a lot of, actually I should say, the characters, the way they speak, you can hear that they're all in the same universe. And this is not the real world, I want to make that absolutely clear. This is not supposed to be the real world. You know, it is this kind of, you know, I mean, you could argue of real noir, regular noir at least, is even supposed to quite be the real world, or it's just a really cynical look at it, but this is a really cynical look at it with some, like, comic book physics to it thrown in as well. You know, people survive some stuff they really shouldn't survive, and they are physically capable of doing stuff that they shouldn't be, but, but yeah, you know, all the characters talk in a way that you can hear that they belong to the same universe, but there are still nice, slight differences. Alexis Bledel plays a sex worker, and she's kind of the young, naive one, and you can tell by the way she talks. Like, she'll mess up her grammar, or, you know, pronounce things. Just, yeah, the, the entire way she presents herself, you get that she's, she's just not as jaded or as experienced as some of the others. You know, actually, I should talk a little bit about the supporting cast. We have Rosario Dawson, in stark contrast to Bledel, with... She plays Gail, also a sex worker. Possibly kind of the leader... I don't know, it's not entirely clear, but, you know, she... She takes charge, at least, some of, you know, the, the sex workers, and... She she has a thing for S and M. Like she has a collection of what's it called, handcuffs, and like you know there there's a scene where someone's getting beaten up, you know 
around the sex workers and she's like licking her lips, just taking it all in, just enjoying herself, you know. And yeah, she's she's a really great character actually. She's she's a lot of fun. I should maybe say the view on women. I mean, if you've read Frank Miller, you probably already know this. He writes women as... I mean, they can be strong. They can definitely be strong. But they're kind of... They are sexual objects in his writing, you know, quite a lot of the way. And, yeah, you know, pretty much every female character that appears in Sin City is actually either a sex worker or at least very... They're defined by their attractiveness, their their sexuality, you know. We got Michael Madsen as this great... You know, he's, he's Hardigan's partner, you know, Bruce Willis' character's partner. And just his, his delivery and his entire... He also has the kind of, you know, worn down cop kind of thing going on, you know. I suppose that's about what there is to say about the characters, really. Carla Gugino, I, I probably completely butchered her name. Anyway, she's in this as the Marv's therapist. Not Marv. Marv's parole officer, sorry. She's dating his therapist. Anyway, she's dating a therapist once. Anyway, whatever. And, you know, there's such a thing as a no-nudity clause. I don't think anybody ever told Car Carla Gugino that. Yeah. Uh, actually, on nudity, if you've read the comics, you know that there's a substantial amount of nudity, both genders, in the comics. They tone that down a bit, you know, so that it's not too distracting. Don't worry, they didn't tone down all of it. They, you know, I don't mean just nudity. I mean, the violence is quite explicit and detailed, you know. It is a hard film to watch. And it's actually, it's a surprisingly engaging film because it kind of is just this, I don't know, I just, something tells me it shouldn't quite be as engaging or rewarding and entertaining as it is, but you really get into these characters and the these dramas. And it also, I mean, it is three stories, or sort of four, there's, there's this book ending kind of thing going on as well, but really the main chunk of the film, almost all of it, is these three stories. And you get into all three and you're not bothered by the, I mean, this you know, did well in mainstream. I, I, usually mainstream kind of frowns upon there being more than one story because it's not like it just goes back and forth. You have an entire chunk of the film focused on one character, then that story ends, then you pick up with another character, you know, and yeah, it just, you really get into these stories and they are varied enough. They are three different types of stories. You know, Marv, it's a revenge story. Dwight, you have this kind of situation that he's trying to deal with. And Hardigan, you have this, you know, he's trying to protect this this girl. And yeah, all three are fairly different stories. The There are some nice plot twists and just the I should also say, you know, something that really helps that, again, that Rodriguez didn't write it, this is well-structured storytelling, you know, this, yeah, you, you really get nicely into it. Each story gets roughly 40 minutes, and by the way, the two-disc DVD has slightly longer versions of them, but in order to watch them, you will actually have to watch them independently of each other, not edit it together into a feature. And the way they edited it together for the feature, I'm not going to give away give away what they did, but I quite liked it. I thought it was very clever what they did. And I don't really think they should, you know, 
I think it's unfortunate to watch. I, I'd recommend anyone who watches this at least once watch it the way it was shown in theaters. You know, watch the regular theatrical version, which is also on the two-disc DVD. This entire thing was shot in, you know, a green screen room, so basically just the props and the actors were there, and pretty much all the sets were were digitally added later, and that gives them a tremendous amount of freedom. And it, you know, as as far as just you know how they can shoot things and the distance they can go and how they can make things look, and that's something that's really vital to this. It captures the look of the comic books perfectly. You are literally looking at Sin City. You are looking at this just horrible. I mean, my theory on what Miller was doing with the, is doing, I don't know if he's still writing actually, with Sin City is just this cynical look at the darkest sides of the big city, you know, so you have all this, you have the crime, you have the mafia, you have the corruption, you know, all these kinds of, I, I really get the feeling that Miller does not like priests, you know, from this and 300, the man has a big problem with, like, you know, at least representatives of organized religion. It's paced quite well, I, you know, it, it never gets boring. And they actually literally did put pretty much everything that was on the page up on the screen. There are little bits where, like, you know, some of the dialogue has been, j j a very little, small amount. Of dialogue has been removed. I think it's one of the sex workers who, like, in, in the comics she has, like, I don't know, ten lines maybe, in this she has, like, one. You know, but she is a minor character and the lines didn't really, you know, you don't particularly lose anything. And, you know, the, then there are a few, like, short little scenes Several of those have are added in in the longer versions, and you know I will say whether or not you've actually read the comics, if this is something that you are likely to enjoy, you will enjoy it. I read the comics. I read all three comics just before watching the movie, and yeah, I loved seeing it right up there on the screen, and you know. If you haven't read the comics, you will be able to follow it just fine, you know, and actually all three stories, I think all Sin City stories actually, are self-contained. This does mean that there is a bit of expository dialogue, you know, there, there are scenes where, you know, dialogues are monologues, where literally characters just, there's a lot of monologuing, and it, it's perfect, you know, all three of our protagonists monologue, narrate to themselves and us at points. And, you know, and some of it is this just, yeah, they're, they're being very descriptive and they're saying, you know, this is the situation, well, yeah, this, this is the situation that I'm in, you know, so that you don't really need to know the character before. But it really works, you know, it's never boring, it's not actually, I don't know, it's not quite like Terminator, but like with that movie, the first Terminator, whenever there's expository dialogue, it's not actually boring, you know, they, they make it interesting still. This is also an extremely tense film. You know, from start to finish, it just grips you and does not let go. Something is constantly happening, there's constantly new developments that really make it seem like, you know, they're never going to get out of this well, you know, that like, oh crap, now our protagonist is definitely going to die, you know, stuff like that. About the monologuing and dialogues, the the words chosen and the way it's all put together, Miller has a real talent for using words to really, truly paint a picture. You know, I mean, both comics and film are visual mediums, and yet he still 
really uses words a lot. And sometimes I think they can be even more effective. And it's also just that, you know, it's not like either the comics or the film are not also extremely visual. It just adds to it and, you know, I don't know, I just think it it's better than if it was all visual, you know. But yeah, he has these, you know, with with just a few lines, he just sets up a situation so perfectly, and you just you really get into it, you know. It's just like there when when Dwight is in a car, and you know driving down the road, and he's like he's thinking, okay, do you know th there's there's a cop trying to pull me over. This is bad because, and he he like goes through you know. If he, you know, yeah, it's, it's when he's just following Jackie Boy, and obviously, if he gets pulled over, he's not going to be able to keep following Jackie Boy. He'll he'll lose Jackie Boy, and he may not be able to find him again in time. So he's like, "Do I try to kill him?" I mean, you know, it. Actually, he's he's like, you know, I don't have enough money to bribe him, even if I did. There's always the off chance that he's one of those few honest, you know, good cops. And you just, these these thoughts going through his mind, and you just really get into it, and you're like, ah, oh, crap, what is he gonna do? And it just, the whole thing, and it just, and I think it's an appropriate amount of narration as well. There's not, there's neither too much nor too little. I suppose that pretty much does it. Finally, I will just say this is very much, it's, it's a feast in the way, it's, it's a visual feast in the way of the cars, the, what's it called, the guns, and the women. You know, it's very, very focused on all three. And do not ask me about the cars because I'm not a car person. Feel free to ask me about the guns though. That, but, yeah, it also has this really nice, wicked sense of humor. Some of that is Frank Miller. Some of that is right on the pages of his original comics. Some of it is Rodriguez, and, you know, the, they go together really well. It's like with Rodriguez and Tarantino, actually. They're, they're peas in a pod, definitely. And, yes, Tarantino did direct a scene in this, and, yes, it is good, but, you know, Rodriguez directed the rest of it, so, yeah. Now, yeah, I think that pretty well covers it. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.